Hi, I've been writing about a watch known as the Seiko Pogue on my blog, vintagewatchadvisors.com and I figured out I would uh, record a, a short video just to outline some of the, the main differences that you'll find uh, across the range of watches. Now, uh, what we're looking at here are three fairly early examples of the 6139-6000 series. Uh, the one on the left is from June 1970, the one in the middle is from February 1970 and the one on the right is a very rare uh, October 1969 uh, silver watch. Now the silver one was never shown in any catalogue or uh, there's n never been any photos from Seiko that show these available. They only really concentrated on advertising the blue one primarily and the yellow one. Uh, and the yellow one is the reason why these are collectively known as the Pogue because in 1973 an American astronaut, Bill Pogue, flew to uh, the Skylab uh, space station and he took with him his own yellow Seiko automatic chronograph. It turned out then it, that became the, f the first auto chronograph that was used in space. Uh, and as a result, the whole range is typically called the Pogue. Although you might split hairs and say only the yellow one will count. And in fact, possibly only the American edition yellow one rather than these, which are all uh, kind of mainstream export ones. Now, the very first of this family to come out were all known as the 6139, that's the movement, and then 6000, which was the, the case reference. And the 6000 series came out in uh, early 1969. Uh, many of the, the first ones are Japanese, so you'll see a, a bunch of different finishes. Uh, so they'll have English Japanese day wheel, they'll say speed timer, and there'll be a five sports logo on the, on the dial. Uh, but the ones that are primarily found online when you go search for these things are export models. So these ones that are, 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 I'm going to concentrate on today. Now, We've got a couple in front of us now. Um, the one's the, the, the previously seen um, proof model from 1970. Uh, and this, uh, at, at nine o'clock, it says water 70 meter proof. Regulations came along that basically said that they, they couldn't uh, continue to use that in um, overseas markets. They had to change it to be water 70 meter resist. But in the US, there was never a proof watch. Uh, and another main difference is that in the export markets, like you know, typically anywhere outside of Japan that isn't in the Americas, um, the the watch said Seiko Chronograph Automatic on the dial, whereas in the U.S. markets it just said Seiko Automatic. So the watch on the right here is a, an America's watch. Um, it's, it's, it says resist on the dial. This particular one is dated such that it doesn't have a notch on the case. Whereas there is a notch on the case for the earlier watches. So again, notch cases tended to be phased out in 1970 or thereabouts. Um, the one on the right here is a 1971 watch. Uh, and this is basically the same kind of thing that Pogue would have been wearing, except his was yellow. So when we look at the export models of these watches, 6000, 6001 and 6002 series were the mainstay that were available everywhere else. 6009 was the US market initially, and then that was replaced by 6005. So Bill Pogue's watch was a 6005, uh, and it's the, identified by only having Seiko Automatic on the dial rather than Seiko Chronograph Automatic, which is the, the norm for the other variants. Uh, and uh, there's also the dual count um, below the, the center of the hands, and then below that is the SUA logo. So these things, again, if you're ever looking for a true Pogue, uh, you've got to make sure that this stuff all stacks up correctly. Now, the notched case was a feature that only lasted until mid-1970s. Um, see, the, uh, the, the, essentially just above the crown, there's a small notch been cut in the case, and it's quite possibly done after the case had been manufactured. So you, you do see some some differences between them uh, and individual watches, you know, so unscrupulous sellers might well take a Dremel or something to an old case and then claim it's a notch one. The, not, the notch cases were slightly smaller in terms of height uh, than the non-notched case that replaced them, which means that the notch case can only accept a 6139A movement, which itself is slightly less tall. Uh, the, the, the replacement non-notched case, which we do see with 6139A movements in it, appears to be the same height as all of the other ones, and therefore it feels like Seiko were rolling out the non-notched case 
as the eventual carrier for the 6139B movement. So it's another one of these tie-ups where you, you look for a proof dial, a notched case, a two-piece chronograph hand, the right kind of markings on it. They'll all tell you of the, of the watch's provenance. In most of the overseas markets, the 6000 series gave way to a 6001 model in uh, around about mid-1970. Uh, and the two on the left here are both yellow 6001s. Uh, the the left-hand one is from July, and that still said proof on the dial. Uh, the right, the one in the middle says resist, and this is from October 1970. So these are kind of transitional watches where they had the same movement as the early 6000s. So those were the 6139A movement. Um, they both had the original uh, two-piece chronograph hand. So it's denoted by the fact there's a little circular, uh, circular metal uh, disc in the middle of the hand. Um, they are quite unusual, they're quite rare to get hold of now. In fact, they are uh, they, they're thought of as a single use item. So they're deformed when they fit the watch. And therefore it was standard practice when the thing was being serviced to take that off, throw it away and put a new one on. And the new one was a single piece chronograph hand, such as is found in this one on the right hand side here. So. During the course of the 6001 and 6002 model years, they transitioned across from two-piece chrono to one-piece chrono. And this one on the right-hand side is an early 6002. So this had a later version of the movement as well. So this had a 6139B movement in. And pretty much all of the 6139Bs you'll see with uh, this one-piece chronograph hand. And typically, if you if you see a 6001 or a 6000 series watch that has a single-piece chrono hand, then it's probably been replaced at some point in its life. What we're looking at now is the difference between the T dial and the R dial. So on the right-hand side of the uh, lower part of the dial, there is a four-digit dial code printed. And on the American watches, that's 6009 T typically, and uh, on the export mo uh, models it's 6030 T or R. And the, the T dial on the left here, we saw a moment ago in comparison with the, the others, this is a 6002. Um, and, and this is also a 6002, slightly later, so it's about a year, year older. Still says resist at 9 o'clock, but the, the one on the right here is an R dial. And you can see in comparison, the, the, the colours of the dials are quite different. The, the R dial being much more kind of orangey, it's got a much more pronounced sunburst um, uh, effect on it. Um, and it's quite common to see fake R dials on eBay watches. So it's, it's worthwhile paying some attention to the markings on the, the lower end of the dial, how they match up with uh, uh, you know whatever's at nine o'clock, etc. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the dial codes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 the four digit dial code and then the letter is on the right hand side, just uh, to the side of the sub dial. And uh, in this case, the, the T code indicates the dial finish that's a little flatter. It's, it does have a very subtle sunburst finish to it, but it's, it's nowhere near as pronounced as in some of them. And then on the other side, the Japan 6139 has a small space between it. Uh, now you often see 6030R dials with spaces in or dials that purport to be 6030T dials that don't have spaces. There's other things as well, like there are no proof dials with 6030T. Um, there are some proof dials with, uh, sorry, there are some um, 6030R dials that have uh, resist on them though, so here's an example of one of them. So again, we can see here it is a legitimate resist dial, uh, 6030R on one side and then on the on the side uh, to the left of the subdial, there's no gap between Japan and 6139. Um, other things to look out for in this particular variant, the R dial, is that there's a much more pronounced sunburst finish to the dial itself and the subdial uh, it has a little bit more of a a finish on it as well. The fake dials you see often have very pronounced concentric circles, and they and they just are, are you know the very obvious ones you look for them. Um, also, the, the the other difference here is the serif on the one and the general weight of the figures on the sub dial are much more pronounced. So again, if you uh, go back to the the T dial, you'll see very quickly the uh, the, the the weight of the 
um, the numbers is much lighter and it's a straight one rather than one with a serif on it. And similar to the yellow dials, the difference between T and R also shows up in the other colours as well. So in the, in the case of the silver ones here, again, both of these are very unusual watches. They're both, they're both very rare. The, the, the much plainer finish on the proof T dial on the left in comparison to the radiant uh, finish on the R dial on the right here is quite striking when you put them next to one another. Um, there is also an R dial blue. Uh, I don't have one to hand, but it's a similar kind of feel. So the, the sunburst finish is much more pronounced uh, the sub-dial is slightly different as well, uh, and you'll see a, a number of differences crop up between the two in terms of the layout of lettering and that kind of thing. So paying a bit of attention to, uh, if you're looking at buying a particular bulk at least, paying a bit of attention to whether the, all of these things support one another in terms of the, the layout of the dial and the R versus T and so on is, is, is really important. And the last two examples here are both R dials, uh, this time with no text at 9 o'clock, so uh, that switch happened in um, around about late 1972. Uh, so the, the overall production run for the, this family started in 69, finished in 1977. So by the number of years, you see most of the ones that, that are out there didn't have text at 9 o'clock. And that in turn means the ones that do have text at 9 o'clock tend to be more valuable or more um, collectible at least. Uh, but these are both really nice watches. Uh, the one on the right is uh, known as the Aussie Pogue. So you can see the chapter ring is a different colour. Instead of it being a yellowy uh, dial uh, colour, it's a, a darker, it probably was black but it's faded to a kind of grey colour. So if, again if we compare that to the silver uh, R dial watch, uh, that, that black's much more pronounced. And initially this was thought by collectors to be a fake. So uh, someone had, had replaced the, um, the the chapter ring with a with a wrong one, basically. Um, but then it's been discovered that there were legitimate Aussie pogues all the way back to uh, 1969, 1970 era. Um, it just so happens that the distributor that was selling them down there had a black chapter ring fitted. It seems uh, very often they also had this same uh, Stellox President bracelet on them, like the like these ones are wearing here. Now, it may be that the bracelet was fitted by the distributor. So in the case of the, the silver um, proof Pogue, it was, we think, produced by the Hong Kong distributor uh, as a special order. And um, they would, they, uh, the, the company that had the sole distribution rights for Seiko in Hong Kong, and in fact still does, is part of the Stellux group of companies who started off making bracelets and that kind of thing. So these, these bracelets here have a STL Stellux stamped on the inside of the clasp. So it's quite likely that the distributor made a special order and uh, and then put these bracelets on. And it's also very common to see Aussie Pogues with these too. So it's quite possible that maybe the, the Aussie Pogues were ordered in a similar way to the, the other special editions. So these are the, the, the most common bracelets that you'll see uh, fitted to Seiko Pogues. Um, the one on the left here is known as the narrow H-link. So it's an H-shaped main link on it and it's the same width all the way from the from the, the clasp to the, the end link of the watch. Uh, the one in the middle is a flared H-link or it's actually known as a tapered one as it tapers down from the watch and towards the clasp. Um, the narrow ones tended to be fitted until mid-1973 like 1973 or thereabouts, uh, and then the, the, the flared ones uh, came about after that. Um, the one in the end here is the Stellux President, which I talked about um, already, and uh, it has a, a different uh, look on the clasp, and, is a, and I think is the best of, the, of these bracelets available here. It's much more solid and more comfortable to wear. There were a few other variants as well. Uh, Stellux also produced an H-Link which had the same clasp uh, design as, as the, the President one here uh, and is a slightly heavier bracelet and they also did one known as the Chiclet uh, and quite often we'll see 1969-1970s watches show up with a Chiclet bracelet. That one is very very rare indeed and it's hard to get hold of without uh, spending a lot of money on a watch. Uh, and then there are a, a bunch of uh, specific Japanese special editions that had different stamping like five sports uh, stamps on the on the clasp and so on. Here's a slightly closer look at the clasp on that Stellux bracelet. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video and uh, we'll see you again soon.